Welcome to everybody for listening in, and thanks again, especially to our regular listeners. Uh, for all of our new listeners, uh, my name is Ari Zuckerman, Vice President at Center Court Sports Academy. Um, our goal for our webinar uh, series is to keep valuable information flowing to the local and to the international tennis community, and to keep all of you engaged with creative ideas throughout these times. Um, today's main topic is going to be key aspects of development and match prep. Um, joining us today is our very special guest, Liam Smith. Liam is the current coach of uh, Gao Monfi, uh, who is currently ranked number nine in the world. Uh, Liam is also the national. Liam was, was also the national head coach for Tennis Australia. He coached Radu Albat, uh, Barankis, and has coached on the WTA tour as well as at Justin Hennon's uh, Tennis Academy. Uh, joining me as well is my regular guest, Conrad Singh. Uh, coach Conrad is the uh, COO and Director of Performance and Tennis at the Center Court Sports Academy in Chatham, New Jersey. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Chatham, uh, to you, Conrad. And of course, I thank you and Liam for being on the show today. Ari, thanks a lot uh, for that introduction. And, and Liam, um, welcome to our uh, Center Court Tennis webinar series. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> we, we were just absolutely delighted that you were able to join us. Um, obviously, you've had a, uh, I mean, you're still very young and you've had a very illustrious career to date. Um, I'm going to start with what I regularly start with, and that is give us a quick sort of snapshot um, of your career from, you know, what got you going, where you started with your playing days, where you went from there, and, and how you got to now being with Gail Monfields um, for over a year and a half. Yeah, I mean, just a, I was playing juniors, uh, played junior competitive, some futures, and uh, realized that maybe I wasn't as good as I wanted to be or needed to be, so I started to coach and uh, spent 20 years now coaching, started sort of at uh, the, the low level, club level, um, then started to move to some tennis academies around the world, hitting partner, sort of junior coach, learning, progressing, and going through sort of all the steps. I've been sort of fortunate that I've been through many different stages during my career from, you know, competitive 12 year olds to ITF junior world tour to futures and challenges to ATP and WTA level. So moved around a lot and learned a lot from a lot of people and uh, then spent some time obviously running the academy for, for Justin Hennin, ran academy for uh, in partnership with Harold Solomon and then moved to Australia to took on a role as national head coach to help play development in, in Australia. And then again, back on the ATP tour the last five years with, uh, with Albot and then Ebden and, and now Monfils. So yeah, just uh, as a quick snapshot. <laughs> No, look, I appreciate that. And, and I, I'm absolutely sure we're going to have a great time digging into some of your experiences. Um, just to kind of give everyone a background, how's your year laid out? I mean, we got obviously primarily our listeners today are Centre Court um, tennis players, parents, uh, there'll be some coaches on, but the broader audience, we're all fascinated with the year of uh, a pro player. So how's your year broken down as a coach? And then secondly, Gail's year um, in a sort of snapshot, how would that be broken down? We sort of work it, we work the year a little bit different because we, we basically start in, let's say December. So it's like some countries' financial years don't work on the January to December calendar. We sort of start November, December, and we start with a pre-season. And basically it starts with rest from the, pre the end of the previous season, which typically is gonna end First week of November, now a little bit later, it's, it's pushing through if you play a Davis Cup or if you make the finals uh, in London. Um, and then a little rest period and then into a training block, um, usually between three and six week training block, depending on, on, on when your season ends. And then obviously beginning the, the calendar year and the tournament year in January in, uh, in Australia. And then we generally go through a tournament block through till about Indian Wells, Miami time then we start preparing for the clay season. So we would have a small training block on the clay, set in another series of physical goals and things to prepare for the clay season. Very short training block, usually transitioning from the, the clay to the grass, just adjusting some things and spending time on the grass. And then usually after Wimbledon, we would have a, a, another rest period because rest is, a, is an important part of training. So a rest period after Wimbledon and then a training block on the hard courts in the US prior to events like um, Washington or Cincinnati, Toronto, Montreal and going into the US Open. 
Um, and then again, another rest and a training block and then end of the season period uh, with the Asian swing and then coming back into Europe at the end of the year for some of the indoor events. So we sort of divided up into sort of swings, if you like, um, hard court, clay court, a little bit of grass, back on the hard court and try to always allow time for rest and then training periods built in. So we, we have a sort of periodized program and we know which, which events we want to peak for. Obviously, slams are the, are the big one and then the Masters 1000s, things like that. You mentioned... Now, you mentioned let, me, let me ask a quick question. Um, it, uh, and now year after year, is it a similar tournament schedule that you choose? Or, I mean, uh, you know, I guess it, it, does the player decide based on how they fared last year? Is it, is it, pretty, is it pretty similar for the most part? In terms of the year? Yeah, I, I've always believed that your tournament schedule has to reflect your goals and it has to reflect what you're, what you're trying to do with your game. So, you know, if you're trying to be a more aggressive player, maybe you're going to play a little bit less on clay and more on faster courts and vice versa. And so you sort of set your schedule up according to what you're trying to, what you're trying to achieve. And then obviously there's an element of last year I played well here or I won that tournament before. So I have a good feeling. I want to go back there. But uh, for the most part, of course, everything is centered around the grand slams and the, and the 1000 events. And right. then you put your 500 and your 250 events in to lead in sometimes you're training through those tournaments sometimes you're using those tournaments to try to get some confidence and momentum get a series of matches under your belt going into something bigger uh, try to play a certain style or way in certain conditions to prepare for the same thing in a bigger event later in the year and and so on so you sort of you're using your tournament schedule as a form of sort of developing and improving and helping you to to be ready for the big events uh, that's really interesting stuff. You raised one point there that I've got to elaborate on, and that is um, that rest is a major part of training. Um, I really yeah. hope that everyone listening understood what that means. So it's part of the cycle of training. Now, we've, we've all got this period of rest that no, we didn't expect. So my questions are um, for Gail, what does he do you know, now? What has he been doing what is your recommendation to him at this time? He's not a beginning player. He's been around a while. So this may be something that, I, do you think this is something that could elongate his career? Um, or, or, you know, what are your thoughts on the corona and what it's done for tennis? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's been tough for everyone. Um, at the tour level, at the club level, for juniors competing, everything is, is obviously, for life in general, it's, it's tough. But, uh, you know, you've got to try to find find use with the time that you have. And for us, we've certainly tried to use it as a, a way to rehab and strengthen areas of the body that uh, are injury prone or sometimes break down. Uh, rest is a key element. Sometimes you just get a physical and mental break because the tour is quite tough. People don't always realize it, it can be more difficult than it looks from the outside sometimes with the travel and the, the stress and the different things that the players go through. So sort of a combination of things. And then for me as a coach, I, I've got more time to look at videotape of certain matches against certain opponents and figure out some things for if we can, and, and hopefully sooner rather than later when we can get back out there and compete again. So th those are the main things. Um, obviously there's a lot of stuff that you can do from a physical perspective. You can, you can do training at home still. There's, there's opportunities still to, to do things, improve things and, I think it's important that you don't just do nothing. You've got to think about how can I use the time that I have to be effective. Yeah, absolutely. We had Emma Doyle on uh, yesterday in our 360 program that we run, and she was also talking about the same thing and that at this time, um, creating mini spikes is important. So what that means, I guess, in tennis is you might create, you know, tournament weekend internally, but you treating that as though it's something that is high up on the order of priority. Um, what is Gail up to right now? And, and generally speaking, um, you know, how is he to work with? Uh, right now he's, uh, he's doing some maintenance fitness training with some home equipment. And then he's actually doing a lot of streaming. He's, he's a, he's a big time video gamer. So he's doing streaming on Twitch actually, if anybody wants to look uh, at him play cool. FIFA against uh, Benoit Pair and various other celebrities i think he had um, some basketball players on there as well and so he's doing uh, he's staying busy and active doing that stuff and uh, getting some rest and rehabbing some areas of his body that uh, needed uh, 
you know, further work and attention to hopefully, you know, we've, we're preparing that if we do have any tournaments left this, this year, that they be a very condensed season. It could be two or three months at the end of the year where there's just tournament after tournament. And they're obviously planning to try to prioritize the bigger events. So, you know, his body's got to be ready to handle that. So just trying to get ready for that as well. At this point, um, have you guys been, I mean, what, what is the mindset? Have you got him thinking still towards getting back in August or is, is the US Open still on the radar? Or, I mean, how yeah, are you? It's a tough one because, you know, initially we, we, we were at Indian Wells and then we, um, we left and we realized that, okay, this could be a good few months. And you sort of think maybe Wimbledon. So you're thinking maybe the clay season is going to be gone, but maybe we can play on the grass and then that's canceled. Now we're thinking, okay, maybe sort of September, US Open maybe, that there's discussion of Roland Garros in September. They're talking about Rome and Madrid on the clay, fitting it in in September before they play Roland Garros. And so there's all these things on the table, but you just don't really know what's going to happen. So I think it's, you just got to be kind of calm and stable and, and be ready and able to do whatever whatever's going to happen because from one day to the next, the new news comes out or a new decision is made and, and, it, and it changes again, so. Yeah, just on edge waiting, it's, it's got to be difficult. Um, someone like Gail, who, I mean, he had an illustrious junior career. I think he was one or two in the world as a junior. I think it was Baghdadis and him that were fighting it off in the juniors. Yeah, um, he was one. He, he won three of the four junior slams. Yeah, he, he almost won four, but... So, so one of the, you know, common facts we all know is great juniors don't often um, transition. He obviously has. He's done it very well. Um, yet to win a slam. He's competed well uh, at the French uh, a few times. Made a couple of semis, I believe. Um, well, I mean, where is he at with his career? Is he, is he, is he a genuine contender, do you think, um, to have a, a shot at another slam? Yeah, I mean, it's his goal. It's his goal to win a Grand Slam tournament and be the best player in the world for that two week period of time. And um, it's always been his goal and it, you know, he hasn't been able to do it yet. It's been a tough era for him, to be honest. He's played in a time of the three, maybe even you could say four or five are the greatest players to play the sport all at the same time. So that's obviously been tough, but it's still his goal. And I think he is a contender and he's worked very hard in the last few years to try to put himself back into a position to be a contender. and. He was, you know, on a good path at the start of this year too. I think he's third in the race right now from the first two and a half, three months of play that we had. And he's just really been focusing on getting himself into the position where he gets better at closing out semifinals and finals and winning titles and moving his position in the rankings higher so he gets a better seated position in the slams and opens up some more doors and, and puts himself really in contention because I think... It's one thing to say you want to achieve something. It's another thing to put in the work and actually really be a contender. And your peers, those fellow competitors that are contenders, to actually look at you with that thought of, oh, OK, I've got to watch out for this guy. And, and that's a lot about how you go about it and over the, over the long term. So we're just working hard to try to make sure that he he's puts himself in position. And I think he, he is, he's getting there. He's, he's in a, at a point where he could, uh, he could win a slam, I think, yeah. Well, he's just so talented. I mean, I'm stating the obvious. He's probably in the top one or th two or three most entertaining guys to watch up there with Kyrgios and, and a couple others. And I know they're good mates too. But, um, you know, how is that to coach? That's got to be for a British guy who's come from uh, grass court tennis. Um, you know, you're dealing with a guy who's totally out of the pan. I mean, the way he plays, his technical side is so different, unique. Uh, how was that to handle and, and kind of how do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, he's got his own personality. He's got his own sort of game style. He's very creative. He sees the court um, different than, than some, some other players I've worked with. And shot selections, his vision of, of what's possible is, is somewhat different. And I think as a coach, you've got to, you know, every player you coach is an individual. So you have to adapt you, you can't treat everybody the same. You have to adapt. You have to see what works. And for me, it's always been about how do we make him use what he has in a more effective and efficient way without taking away that personality, that creativity, because he loves to play. He enjoys it. 
he is creative on the court and there's moments where sometimes that creativity that he uses that somewhat unusual shot or unpredictable play actually unlocks a difficult situation or gets gets him across the line so it's, it's finding the balance of how to use that creativity and, and, and the different things that he can do in an effective way. And we've just spent a lot of time talking about that, working on things and, and looking at, it's not just what you do, but it's when you do it. And, and you know, he still hits some pretty amazing shots uh, in the last few years, but they've been generally in, in less, um, less dangerous moments, let's say. Yeah, you're completely right. Um, with, when, you, when they're on the tour, the French guys seem to be very close. Um, you know, they, I think there's the Musketeers, and then there's a couple other guys that are in and out. Um, how is it on the tour? I mean, day to day on the tour, are the guys interacting? Are they, um, are they socializing? Or is that only when they're traveling? I mean, are they close away from the tour? Yeah, no, I mean, they're, they're a fairly tight knit group. I mean, obviously, France are quite fortunate, they have a lot of depth of players. Um, really great Davis Cup team in terms of the depth of, of, of level of players they have and the number of players on the tour. And there's a, there's a nice camaraderie and um, they all get along, happy to practice together. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really nice experience. We had a, we had a good time at the ATP Cup in, in January with the, with the French team, uh, with Gilles Simon as the captain and uh, Benoit Paire. And unfortunately, Lucas Poole couldn't join us. He was, he was going to play. Um, but it was just a lot of fun. Nico Mahut, the great doubles player. And yeah, it was a really nice, uh, small knit group, but very tight and supporting each other. And yeah, I think it's really, uh, it's, it's good. It's very positive. You, you raised one um, really good point about creativity. It just seems to me, um, looking at the French players in particular, they, they're so different. And the way that, you, you know, uh, Monfils plays versus... Gilles Simon versus Gasquet. They, they play completely from brands of tennis. Yeah, Songa. <laughs> Songa, <laughs> you know. And then you look at other nationalities and you maybe see similar, clear similarities between how the players of one era play. Um, is that, I mean, what, what do you put that down to? I know the French have got an incredible competitive system nationally. It's been like that for year, decades. Um, yeah, I, I think the French is, is a good system, to be honest. They're, they're a good club level system, national framework for tournament play and competing. And I think the, you know, the French, there's a certain style and flair um, and flamboyance in, in the way they play. And I think that the coaches in general do a good job of not sort of overcoaching or taking away the, the sort of difference that some of the, the kids have and not making them all play the same way. And I think that's great because... Let's be honest, if, if Gio Simon tried to play like Joe Songa, well, you'd never, you never would have heard of Gio Simon. And if, if Joe Songa tried to play like Gio Simon, you'd never heard of Joe Songa either. So I think it's really good that they, they're allowed them to be individuals and to play the way that seems to work for them. And um, yeah, they've allowed for that. They, they don't, they're not overly rigid in the, in the system in France. They, they seem to have a, a methodology of individuality is, is acceptable. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite refreshing. I think it's also why they've got a lot of players uh, in the top 100, for example. I think they're one of the countries with the most players. I think it's to do with that because they don't try to put them in a box or make them all play, like you said, with a certain style or way. And uh, that in itself is, is not easy. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's commendable. No, you're right. And, and obviously our theme today is aspects of development and uh, match preparation. We'll get to the match preparation in a minute. But, I mean, you've had such a broad experience from private academy to national programs to tour coach. You've worked with guys from different countries. You've had WTA experience. Um, what are the key, I mean, this is a very tough question, but what do you believe are the key stages and key developmental pillars that need to go in place for, let's say, a kid from 10 years old to 20 years old, that decade? Yeah, I think it's, for me, it's always a lot about the planning. You know, you've got to sort of understand what, 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 what are you trying to achieve? Where are you trying to get to? And then scale it back and make, plan, make a plan. Um, and it sounds crazy. Okay, they're only 10. But, you know, time goes quickly and you want to have an idea of what, what you're going to do. So for me, it's always been important to plan and structure the stages. I, I've always felt like up to 14 years old, it's very important to play more in your age group and learn to, learn to win, 
get certain characteristics, get a lot of competition and enjoy the process. And then just for me, I've always felt like skipping the 16 and under age group has been the, has been the way to go. I kind of see it as a bit of a dead age group now. Um, and sort of if you're, if you're an elite level 14 year old, go straight to under 18 competition. Um, with the exception, maybe you play in nationals in the 16s or you play the orange bowl or, you know, there's this in Europe, the European championships to win the 16s is prestigious. But in general, I, I'm not a big proponent of playing 16 and under tennis. Um, always push towards 18 and under after you've played a good level, obviously, of 14s and the ITF junior circuit is a good pathway. And then mixing in a nice balance of the, of the futures and the ITF World Tour events whilst you're playing those junior ITF circuit and junior national 18 and under events. I think that those are, are key things. Um, obviously, you've got to make sure that you've got a, a base that can take you somewhere. So whether it's techn technical, tactical, how you're developing physically and mentally are important as to your process and your journey. And you've got to constantly evaluate and adjust as you go because things are going to happen faster than you hope, or faster than you thought, and sometimes they're going to happen slower than you, you hoped. So it's a, it's a constant, for me, it's a constant sort of managing and adjusting, but planning is, is always the big one. Is no. You've got to understand where, where you're trying to go and how you're going to get there. And if you don't really take the time to do that, it's you, you just get lost and you're just sort of in this shuffle and there's nothing really happening. That's a really clear answer there. Um, obviously, you've had different players you've worked with, you know, all over the place. What would you characterize as the three sort of key ingredients you look for within those athletes before you either accept that project or, you know, if, if you know this, this player's got a good chance of doing something special? What are the three sort of key pillars you look for? Well, it's, it's interesting because I have a slightly different point of view than, than some, but I generally look at character as the first one, because for me, it's uh, when you, when you coach a player and certainly in, in my, from my perspective, I put, I put everything into it. And uh, I feel like if you want to, you want to work with a nice person, you want to work with a good person that has a good character and that, um, you know, you're going to enjoy that process. So for me, that's the first one is just the character of the individual. Um, then it's a lot about the, the attitude, which is sort of connected to the character. But as a coach, how can you improve somebody if the, if the motivation or the attitude and the mindset is not reasonably good to start with? It's, it's, it's a tough project. So I always look towards the attitude part. And then obviously you're going to look at the, the game style and the, and the talent level and, and, you know, do they have the potential to achieve their goals? Because I think one thing that happens a lot in sport is sometimes expectations are not in line with, with what's really possible or what the reality is. So you've got to make sure that the, you know, the, the goals and the expectations that the person has is, is somewhat making sense in, you know, if, um, if they're not, then you're always in a way set up to fail because you're never going to necessarily be able to achieve the expectations. So I think it's just important that, you know, you're on the same page there and that you have a good feeling about the character, the attitude and the expectations that the, that the project presents. Um, a last question from me until I throw over to Ari, who I know has got a, a bucket of questions he wants to get through. Um, it, I find it really interesting that Gail, who he's, girlfriend I believe I'm not too sure their their status is uh Svitolina who's top few in the world and yeah. they seem to spend a lot of time traveling together supporting each other even practicing together um you know what's your take on that that's very different there's not many people out there that are doing that yeah no I mean they have a good a great relationship and they, they support each other a lot they try to help each other when they can watch each other's matches and it's been it's been fun you know we're like a big team we got a in a slam, we've got a women's match and a men's match and we, we've got it all going on. But uh, yeah, it's been good. I mean, they practice together a little bit, not, not that much. They do warm up sometimes each other for matches and things because that's cool. we often use hitting partners or I hit or something for the warm up. So she's better anyway. So um, they warm up a bit together and they hit a little bit. Sometimes when we first arrive to a new tournament, new location, they might hit the first morning or something just to get used to the conditions. 
but uh, they can't practice all the time together because the the balls are different. A lot of the time, tournaments use different balls for the men and the women, and the the weight and heaviness of the ball can be different as well. So, but when they do practice, it's great, and uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun actually. So, what's your what's your take then on uh, the you know? There's a bit of media going around at the moment on the com- combined tour. That would be ideal for them. <laughs> yeah, that would work. Yeah, I think it's you know. Tennis is tennis, you know, it's uh, we have so many organizations and so many things going on. It's obviously the more unity that you have and the more that everybody's on the same page, it's going to be better for the sport. It's going to be better for the players, the fans, what exactly that looks like and how they would do it. I'm I'm not sure, but just in general, the concept of being more united and working together, um, I think it's a positive thing. Good. Ari, did you have any uh, questions you wanted to um, ask? Yeah, I just got a few on the top of my mind. We have a lot of coaches that generally listen in and, or will listen, you know, later on because this is obviously on, on Facebook. Um, so they're always interested in what, you know, what these top coaches such as yourself, what they, what makes a good practice session, um, some of the keys to a good practice session and, and, and uh, you know, what, 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 how to get the most out of the hour or two that they're on court with these kids, you know, once a week or a couple of times a week. So we yeah. your thoughts on that. For us, it's, I'm, I'm always a, a big believer in that there has to be a purpose to everything that you're doing. So everything that you do needs that sort of specific purpose and direction behind it. So every time we go to practice, we've got a, a clear outline of what we're trying to achieve. We're, we're working on something in particular. We're trying to improve something. We're trying to you know, use a particular situation to get better. And that, that's what we always do. We always set an objective. So for example, if we're doing, a, if we want to improve return to serve, we might go out and it might be a practice set that, they, that is being played, but the focus is on the return of serve. So we're really paying attention to how many balls are going in the court. What's the percentage of points one, potentially just keeping a little bit of a track in your mind, paying more attention to not giving any free points when you're returning and just always try to have a purpose behind what you're doing on the court. And I think, there's a lot of young players that don't do that very well. They, they just go out and hit balls or, you know, the kids don't really, you know, I remember when I first got to Australia, I would ask a junior in the national program, oh, okay, what, what are you working on? They, they didn't know what they were working on. So for me, it's important that communication with the player that you, you both understand, well, I'm trying to improve my forehand, I'm trying to do this or I'm trying to get, you know, and there's a clear understanding of what you're doing and why you're doing it. And for me, that's always been huge. And it's, it's at every level, whether you're on the court with an eight-year-old with an orange ball or whether you're, it's a top 10 player, you want to make sure that you're being productive with your time. And uh, I still see it on the tour even. There's so many players that go out and they spend hours practicing, but they're just hitting the ball around. They're not really, there's no focus to it. And, you know, that, that's a purpose in itself. You can go out and say, I'm just going to get used to the conditions. I'm going to get a rhythm or I'm going to warm up for my match or I'm going to warm up to play sets later on that's a purpose that's okay but that can never be your only purpose i think when you're on the practice court you've got to really be pushing yourself and striving to improve awesome i mean uh, you know i love that answer and then on that note um you know gail's gone from like like 46th to 29th uh, i guess ninth in the world currently ever, ever since everything stopped and i mean is there you know without, you know, maybe sharing too many secrets. Is there some, like, secret sauce? Did you change stuff? I mean, that's, that's an insane jump in a year, in a year and a half, I mean, right? And, you know? So, yeah, I mean, know, what, he... What, what do you, what, you know, what, what, any specific technical changes? What's... Uh... Yeah, first of all, obviously, most of the credit has to go to him because he's put in a lot of work and he's been very motivated and he's been very open to looking at ways he can improve and play better tennis. And I think that's the, that's the first thing. A coach is only going to be as effective as, as the motivation and the work that the player is willing to put in and, and to buy into a lot of things. But definitely in this last period, we've put a big emphasis uh, on him using his speed and his athleticism to be a little bit more aggressive than defensive and only be defensive when he's forced to rather than choosing to, to play that way. So there's a, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's important to play up on the baseline. Um, men's tennis, it, it can be a myth sometimes that you have to be on the baseline because sometimes it, it doesn't make sense. You do have to, to drop further back sometimes to tr- track down balls or handle the pace or heaviness. But it's that movement in and out of the baseline that's so important. And 
what happens with players that are fast and they move well is sometimes they, they drop back far in the court and they just stay too far back. So we put a lot of emphasis with when he is further back in the court that he has to recover back up to a slightly more aggressive court position faster and use his speed in the recovery, not just in the getting to the ball part. Because a lot of players can be a little bit lazy sometimes with the, the effort they make in the recovery after they've played their shot. And that gives you an opportunity to be more aggressive sometimes on that next ball than you previously would have been. So we've, we've done a lot of work on that. We've done a lot of work on being more aggressive, getting forwards more, using his athleticism. And he, he volleys pretty well, actually, and just improving the confidence level and finishing points at the net. So it's about being more efficient and more effective and using what you have. Um, Ari, before you, you jump into a quick question oh. there, um, I wanted to ask you how much we had Craig O'Shaughnessy on in week one, who I'm sure you know is a legend in what he does. Um, how much is that playing a part in preparation for Gail, either going into a new um, uh, surface or a new opponent? Are you using a lot of stats? Are you using a lot of that kind of available data? Yeah, I use a lot. Yeah, you know, most, mostly during tournaments, I don't sleep that much because I, I watch a lot of video of the opponents that they're, that they're coming up against and go through a lot of Hawkeye data and stats that we get through the ATP. And yeah, there's, there's a, a mass amount of information out there. And um, I have a lot of stuff in my own computer that I keep record of on different players and things. And we, yeah, we, we're using it, using it a lot. I think the thing with stats is, is you have to use it. You have to take everything you can from it, but you've got to, it, it's how you implement it. It's how you apply it. And I think if you follow the stats too re religiously, you can also get in trouble because the, the great players, they, they feel what's going on on the court and they make adjustments. So yeah, we look at patterns, we look at serving locations, we look at different things, but I always try to break it down to a very simple, very simple plan that you're going into in the match about certain situations you want to tip the scales in your favor and get the ball to certain areas of the court, make sure that your strengths are in play and things are as much on your terms as possible in, in a very simplified way, because, you know, execution is, uh, is only, is only good if, you, if it's something that you can do. So simplicity is always the key to execution in, in my book. So that's really interesting because again, Craig was saying um, many of the players that he helps that, that he cannot deliver it in the same way to them. Some of them want to see it visually. Some of them want to see themselves commit those errors. Some of them will just take on, look, don't give me the dribble. Just give me the, the nut and I'm going for it. Uh, yeah. What sort of learner is Gail? We've yet to describe him in any of those sort of categories okay. of learner. Yeah, Gail likes to watch a lot of video. He, he watches a lot of his matches. We spend a lot of time looking at different videotape and different situations and trying to come up with a few solutions for a couple of particular opponents that have always been tough for him. And uh, so he's, he's good visually, but when it comes to matches, we, uh, yeah, it's very simple. I give him three, four things and this is what needs to happen. And he takes that on and he's, you know, fortunately for me, a coach are only as good as the player. And he's been really good about being able to go out there and execute some, 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 some plans and, and, and make adjustments as needed as well, which is a big part of the game. So, yeah, it's, um, I would say he's a combination of the two things. Ari, there's a question that's come in from Jonathan Moore, if I can ask. Uh, Liam. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, do you set up situations specifically or practices for Gail's creativity? Or, do you, uh, or is it just him naturally implementing what's happening in the flow of the game? We, we do a lot, a lot of the training we do is point based and situation based. So a lot of that comes out anyway. And I think in his case, he's, he's had many, many years. He's almost 17 years on the tour. Um, so he's, he's got a lot of experience as a player. So he knows when to use his creativity. But um, we do do certain exercises, obviously clay season. We, we start to mix in using drop shots and angles and things a little bit more within the, the, the point play and the training that we're doing but nothing that's necessarily specific. You know, we don't, uh, we don't actually practice trick shots or, uh, or any of that stuff. A lot of it just comes to him in the moment. And um, he's honestly, he's been using a little bit less of the creativity and he's been trying to be more disciplined about when he uses it and why he uses it. And I think it's, it's been quite effective. 
No, I Love find it. that really interesting. Um, a second part of what we wanted to get through today was match preparation. So, as you well know, um, you know, in, in any academy, any tennis situation, you have kids that train really well and they get up to the line and something happens, right? So, it's in that uh, preparation or that, that sort of procedure um, and the repetition, et cetera, that, that can get them over the line usually. What are your key nuggets that you could deliver to, to our young academy players that, you know, uh, wanting to bring their training form into match play or, or is there any tips you can offer them for match preparation? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a lot about mindset and it's a lot about self-belief. And, um, you know, tennis as a whole, because we have ranking systems and different things, there's always that hierarchy aspect of, oh my God, I'm playing this person whose UTR is higher than mine or they're ranking, they're, they're, they're seated this or that. And there's always that element that, oh, uh, it'd be amazing if I could beat him, but I probably won't. And so I think self-belief is a big one. You've got to go into matches with, with, a, with a strong sense of self-belief and confidence. And you've also got to go in with a plan because if you go in with somewhat of a game plan or an understanding of the last time I played this player, I served too much to this area and, and they killed me or, you know, I kept getting hurt with the out wide serve. And if you go into the match with a little bit more of an understanding about what you're going to try to do, that can help boost your sort of confidence. And then for me, I think it's always a big one. When you, when you go into a match, you, you've got to have, obviously you want to win the match. I mean, there's no, there's no debate about that. You're playing a match, you want to win. Everybody wants to win. But you've got to have that sort of performance goal mindset of, I'm going to try to have a better percentage of first serves today, or I'm going to try to, you know, make more of my backhand returns through the middle of the court, or I'm going to attack the second serve a lot more, even if I'm going to be willing to miss a few, but I'm really going to punish that second serve. And if you give yourself little goals, little objectives to, to take out there onto the match court, that actually helps you because you just go through your process of trying to do those things. And the next thing you know, you're shaking hands and, and the match is maybe you've won the match. So I think it's more about how you go into it with that mindset and then that process that just sort of keeps you in the moment and little step by step through the match rather than overthinking the whole match itself or the occasion or I want to win or I don't want to lose to this person again or, or whatever that might be. Can I ask um, a question? To, uh, very almost almost the same question i guess but po but for like the post match you know a lot of kids have trouble you know if they win of course if they lose they have you know more more difficulty uh you know dealing with that but you know we were talking to michael russell and he tells he told some great stories of of how he dealt with his you know his uh um the players that he was coaching i'm just, I'm just wondering like you know when when gail has a great win against you know felix in rotterdam is there something that you do post match as opposed to you know when you play Djokovic in, in dubai and you had that tough loss just wondering kind of how you handle that and, and, you know, similarly, any advice you have for kids after a tough loss like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, for me, I've always believed that it's important to compete, that you don't get sort of too high when you, when you win and you don't get too low when you, when you lose, because that, that space in between is the emotion that you're carrying with you in the match. It's the high of the win and the low of the loss. So if you can keep those two things a bit closer together in a more sort of balanced line, you actually can compete better. So I've always been big on the same routines when you win or lose. Um, you, you know, you still do your cool down the same way. You still go about things the same way. Obviously, you win a match or you win a tournament, there's a lot more, you're a lot more happy and excited in a way, or you're a bit more, you know, after you lose the match to Novak there in Dubai, it was, it was a tough one, that one. Right. But um, trying to maintain the same routine, trying to look at the match in an objective way, a constructive way, and also be positive about the things that happen in matches because the reality is, and people don't realize this, a lot of junior players don't realize, but top professional players, they still lose a lot of matches. I mean, if, if you're number one in the world and you enter between 15 and 18 tournaments a year and you win five or six, you've had a great year and you're number one. But there's actually 18 events, so you've lost in say 12 of them, you've lost, and six you've, you've lifted the trophy. So you have to be able to, um, accept and handle the fact that sometimes you're going to lose you don't have to like it but there's always going to be something that you can take from it so i always try to think keep the routine the same and look at what can you take from a positive perspective that helps you the next day the next match the next tournament yeah i love that i've got i've got all my stats here i did this remission before yeah gail's lost 765 matches in his career and he's one of the best players in the world so right. 
everybody loses. He's won a lot more than that, but. <laughs> yeah, so imagine that's 765 times that it can either be a positive thing that you grow from it and learn from it, or it can be a negative thing. You might as well make those 765 things something that you can gain, grow from. Um, if I could ask you, Len, that's so interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm all about that. I really love the fact that juniors, you know, when they accept that I can lose, they free themselves to win. And when they understand that they're going to lose almost half the you know, amount of points played on the day, um, they tend to play a lot better because you, you're ready, you're prepared for that. Well, yeah, I mean, look, let's be real. The, the best players in, in the last decade, in the last two decades, their average is winning 53 or 54% of the points. So when you say that to a junior, when you say, okay, you're going to go out and play 10 points against your mate, if you win six, you're doing great. But they never think about it like that. <laughs> you know, they, they don't, they, they, it doesn't always equate. So, yeah, and I think when you also, when you let go a little bit of the outcome and you focus more on the process and the performance, you, you're going to play better tennis. And sometimes you, you're going to play the big points better because you, you're a little bit more free and you, you know, you accept that there's a lot of points that you're going to lose in the match too. You're going to, I, I actually had a few matches where, where my players won a higher percentage of points and lost the match. And I've had other occasions where they've actually only won 49% of the points and they've won the match. So, you know, I think when you start to understand those things and you sort of accept them, you can actually compete better too because, and, and it can help you in the big point moments. Yeah, so on that topic, um, obviously, uh, I look after the Performance Academy at Senecourt. Um, we have a lot of very smart kids. They're going to very good, good schools. They're academically very strong. And obviously, you know, trying to help the parents along the pathway, which is a journey that goes up and down and sideways and all in all directions, understand that, you look, your, your child might be an A-plus student or an A student, but in tennis, 55%, 60% is an A. Yeah. Like, try to understand that. It equates to, you cannot say, my kid is a great student, therefore they should be a great tennis player. And, you know, it's the same characteristics because it's not. Um, and I often talk about the things like, you know, risk taking, when are they taking risk? Uh, when are they playing faster? When are they playing slower? Understanding of momentum, understanding of, you know, different surfaces. All of those things are essential. And so this leads to my next point with you, Liam. We just uh, released an online um, tennis academy with our buddies, um, and partners at Soho, uh, Soto Tennis Academy, Dan uh, Kinnan, who I'm sure you know well, another palm, awesome. you know, great guy. And so we're trying to encourage the players right now to embrace that this is the moment to become a student of the game. This is the moment to, to make your brain muscle become the strongest it can be so that when you get out there again, and whether it be summer and it's, you know, 40 degrees and blazing heat, you can stick to what it is you're doing. What are your thoughts on that side of the game? And at what age do you think kids should be starting to, you know, realize more how important it is? Yeah, I think it's, it's massively important and, and, and great job for, for putting together what you put together. I mean, I think it's a really important part of, of the game. And these days, I, I, I see like the kids don't really watch that much tennis. No, you, you, you might go on YouTube and, and, and you see the highlights. But a lot of the time, the highlights don't really show you those momentum swings, the key moments that really did win or lose that match. And so from my coaching perspective with juniors, I've always sort of tried to make it compulsory that you have to watch matches. You have to, take, you have to sit for the whole two hours and watch this whole match to, to see what happened and understand and give young players little projects like, okay, I want you to give me an analysis, get a piece of paper and a pen and give me an analysis of what just happened with Rafa and Roger in that final of whichever event that might be and get them to become students of the game. Because one thing that I think is really interesting is a lot of the best players in the world, they love to watch tennis. Like if, yeah. when you're in the locker room, yeah. you know, in, inside the locker rooms at the big tournaments, you've got the TV screens and you've got the scoreboard is up so that you know if you're the next court on what the score is and or you're following all the scores. But there's also going to be certain courts, you know, often it's the big courts, but the matches are on and you can, you can see the video. 
you'd be surprised how often you see Roger Federer or Rafa Nadal or Novak Djokovic or Gail or different people sitting, watching matches, discussing, so, geez, look at this guy. He's, he's playing unbelievable with his backhand. And they're students of the sport and they, they watch a lot and they, they really, everyone can learn from each other. So I think it's, uh, it's something that juniors need to do more of and they need to become more aware of everything that's going on on the court because there's a lot more happening than just a ball being knocked around sometimes. Well, that's so true. And it, it, as well as that, um, what I encourage parents, and again, many parents listening in, is please switch on the TV. Even if there's replays right now and it's not live, it really doesn't matter. You're going to watch some great matches. And remember, those guys commentating more often than not were very, very good players themselves. So yeah. it's almost like you're getting a free mental private lesson every hour that you're watching tennis. Yeah, it's, it's something that I think, especially at this time, I've been encouraging some juniors that I try to help here and there to, to focus obviously on their school, to try to get ahead so they can play more tournaments once, um, once they're allowed to play again, but also to watch matches. And we're really lucky at the moment because you've got Roger, Rafa and Novak. And honestly, Stan and Andy and some of the other guys are, in other eras would be big legends too with what they've done. They're all playing at the same time. So you get to see these incredible matches and these incredible, not just ball strikers or athletes, but tacticians and learn from them because uh, they, they won't be there forever. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to sit and watch uh, a little bit more of, of some of those big matches over the last decade and enjoy and learn. Yeah, you're spot on right there. So I wanted to ask you a little bit also, if I could, um, doubles. Is Gail playing doubles? We've been talking a lot about doubles. And on Thursday, we have the great Rohan Bapana uh, from India, highest ranking guy. three, legendary guy, great player. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a huge run coming from Australia, coming from Melbourne. You know, well, you lived in my great city. I call it the greatest city on the planet. Um, we love doubles. You know, it, it's part of our blood. We play on grass courts. We, and it, it often feels very difficult to encourage kids today to take doubles seriously. We've had Dave Fish from Harvard. We've had, you know, Billy Pate from Princeton. All these guys telling us, guys, focus on your doubles. It's going to help you. We know that Craig talked about, you know, something like 80%, almost 80% of the time you go to the net, on the, you're going to win the point. Win the point. So we, we had um, the great Mark Kovacs, Dr. Mark Kovacs, talking about this is a time to develop your volley. Go home, get on the wall every yeah. day. You know, yeah, we had Gigi on. Gigi, Gigi was uh, pretty good herself back in the day. It's amazing what you can do on the wall, actually, with your volleys. It's something, right. yeah. So Gigi Fernandez was talking about a 17-time Grand Slam champion, was talking great about double player. Yeah. she turned pro with only a volley, a slice <laughs> backhand, and a chip forehand. She turned pro with those. She had to learn topsy when she got into the you know college levels and, and progressing through. So my question to you is, that's a very long question. How important is doubles development? What is your thought about the volley in the game of tennis? And finally, would you, do you encourage your players to play singles and doubles, especially when they're younger coming on? Maybe girls. Yeah. You know, so over to you. Yeah, I mean, doubles is massively important. Um, and I think the, the move that the ITF Junior World Tour made when they included the doubles points, 25% of the points from doubles being added to the combined sort of basically the singles ranking, I think that was really important because it encouraged all the young players to play more doubles. You know, it's like anything. If you want to get better at something, you've got to do it more often and you've got to be at some point able to do it under some sort of match scoreboard pressure. So doubles is a great opportunity for practicing your serve under pressure, returns, moving forwards, your net game, your sense of, of how to move on the court and control the ball. So I've always pushed the, the young players to play lots of doubles. Um, players, when they're trying to improve their attacking game as well, to, to play a lot more doubles, it's very, very important. Uh, in Gail's case, he doesn't play that much anymore because... Um, He's, he's getting older, his body's, uh, you know, he's had little injury things here and there. So he tries to preserve his body for singles. And, and you see the same thing with Roger and Rafa and, and, and the guys that they don't play as much doubles. I think that's the problem that juniors don't see it as, as, as exciting because those guys don't always play. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason that they don't play because they're trying to protect their body. You know, if you play, if you play seven, five in the fifth, it's pretty hard to come out the next day and play a, a doubles, you know, so... 
there's a there's a different reason why they don't play. But um, you know, certainly they played a lot when they were younger. Roger played a lot. He's a very good doubles player, and I think it's vitally important for young players to play. And um, it's not happening enough, to be honest. It, even the, even the, some of the players I worked with on the tour, I would push them to play a little bit more doubles, uh, especially in in less important tournaments, just to get also practice hours on the court. Um, and the volley, have you got any simple? Uh, maybe a one-two simple drill you can offer any kids um, that they could do at home uh, to develop their volleys or, or, their, or their slices or chips or any of those specialty type shots? Oh, for sure. The, I think the best one that I've seen and, and used is, the, is using the wall and you play one forehand, one backhand. And you have to control the, you have to control the pace and the, you have to hit the same spot on the wall so the ball travels from side to side. And then obviously it's quite quick, it's very compact. I think Leander Pays was doing it with a frying pan to illustrate how, how to do it. And Todd Woodbridge, Cara Black, I think was as a kid, there was a video of her. It's exceptional. Yeah, incredible. Um, the best I've ever seen do it personally is Todd Woodbridge. It was an unbelievable hands on the volley. But that's a great thing that you can do at home, in the garage, on, on an outside wall, somewhere, just one forehand, one backhand. Um, from, for me, as a coaching perspective as well, I think that a lot of kids, when it comes to volleying, they don't actually use their legs properly. They, they try to volley by swinging and using their hands and all sorts of things. And they don't do those simple, basic fundamentals with the legs. So for me, I've always been a big proponent of the, you know, volley with your legs, get down low, move through your volleys and really make sure that you're doing a good job with the lower part of your body. And actually the upper part, it can be a little bit more simple. Um, that's the sort of Australian old school uh, wow. style of volleying. And, you know, Stefan Egberg, for example, same thing. And I think a lot of kids try to be too, too cool for school or use their hands too much. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so that leads us on perfectly. Um, we've, we've, all, we've been going almost an hour, could you believe it? But that leads us on perfectly to, could you let us know, Liam, um, what you're up to now other than Gail? Obviously, um, I'm so impressed. You've launched an incredible website. Could you tell us about that? Um, I don't know if you want to share your screen at all, show us anything. Um, Actually, you... my, my technological skills are not amazing, so I don't even know how to do that. So I won't um, attempt it in I case, can, I, in case I, I cut it all off. I can put your website into the, into the chat, so I'll give it to everybody. Um, Maybe let us know how it works, what, what's on your website, um, what's the, you know, the content. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, some of the players that I've, I've worked with over the years pushed me a little bit to, they've always been saying to me, I should put something online, I should do something. And I've, I've never really done it. I've sort of shied away a little bit. And um, with the lockdown that was going on, a few people said to me, look, why don't you try to do something, create something, and it could be good. So I decided to, to put some work into developing a, a basically a video series. It's an informational, tutorial-based video series that young players, their parents, young coaches, coaches can take some of uh, my sort of things that I've learned over the last 20 years and my experiences and knowledge. And it's a way of sharing that and uh, helping young players maybe with their own journey to get an understanding of some of the key, key things in their development process. So it's, uh, you know, I've been lucky in my career. A lot of people have helped me and given me great advice and support and it's just a way to give, uh, give, you know, share some of that knowledge and information. So it's, uh, it's available uh, online. Let me give it a whirl here. I'm going to try and share it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give it a, give it an attempt here. So how many, how long did it take you to, you know, compile or how many years worth of video material have you been able to compile? Well, it's, it, it, obviously, it's all of my career, so 20, 20 years coaching that has gone into the sort of philosophy. It's a, it's a sharing of my philosophy and a sharing of knowledge and information and how to structure and do things for your, your development. Um, and then it was, you know, hundreds of hours of filming and editing and trying to put it together. It's all tutorial based. It's, uh, it's basically me there with some uh, screen stuff and some interactive stuff that comes up. But... Uh, yeah, it's more information tutorial based and it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's sort of set in a way that a, a young player, a parent or a coach can, can listen and, and, and get some, you know, hopefully valuable information out of it to help them on their own, on their own journey and process. 
you guys can see it here, right? I'm showing you the screen yeah. with all your videos. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, so you can see where the lines come up on the videos. It's like bullet points uh, come up to, to the different topics. And I went through a lot of topics and tried to choose things that uh, would be, you know, be questions that parents would have, things that coaches might want to get a bit more of an idea of from how I've gone about it and how some of the, the players I've worked with go about certain things. And yeah, it's, uh, it's meant to be hopefully a useful tool to, to help uh, players, parents and coaches navigate their own, you know, tournament and competitive and trying to be the best player they can be journey. Liam, do you have um, a topic in there that I ask everyone because I find it fascinating. Um, do you have a topic in there on how to play as a lefty, if you're a lefty, and or how to play against a lefty if you're a right. I actually don't know because but that's a, that'd be a good one to put in with some interactive stuff with some point play and on court stuff. So I might have to try to figure out how to add that. Yeah, but, feel, free, um, feel free to dedicate that one to Senate Court and Conrad. We'll be, we'll, we'll, okay, that's a good yeah. that's a good idea. Yeah, lefty. Yeah, we we'll got um, a couple lefties. But good. you know, look, um, I think uh, Ari. I'm not sure if you have got any other questions there for Liam. We've I, can't uh, I mean, I have a ton, but uh, we'll save it for, for another time. I know, I know, uh, I know we're going to wrap things up, but uh, yeah, I certainly enjoyed it. That was, that was unbelievable. Liam, um, on behalf of Center Court um, Tennis Academy, it, absolute pleasure to have you on. You're, you're an absolute uh, mountain of knowledge and experiences. And, and it's just, it's so interesting to hear your perspective. And, and the, one of the main reasons I'm really attracted to your content and, and who you are as a coach is that you've done everything. You've worked from the junior to the pro, to the club, to the men's, to the women's. Um, you know, now you're doing a lot of education through a video series. I find it just so interesting. And if I could ask you one last tip on and one last question, it's going to be, if you were a parent of a young, aspiring, good player in the, let's say the, the 13 year old range, what sort of, um, you know, a couple of bits of advice would you give the parents to help their kids? I think it's to, it's, it's to view it as a process and to sort of have a plan and try to not be over, overly reacting to a loss or a period of time where they're not hitting their backhand so well, but try to view everything as a big picture. What's the, you know, always come back to that big picture and don't be overly reacting to, to the day-to-day -day stuff because there's always going to be wins and losses and today was a terrible practice or, but not to overreact just to try to always think about it as a process and I think the other thing is is just not to compare you know you, you might be better than everyone else right now or you might be worse than than some of your peers but don't compare focus on your own journey what you're doing and how you're going about it and the, the rest of the stuff will often take care of itself and I think too often parents get caught up in being over, over, overreacting about sort of small stuff and then too much comparing. And then, then they're changing course and they're not, not having any consistency or continuity about how they're, they're going through the development of, of that young player. I think that's absolutely terrific. And just to, to close up, Liam, I'm not sure you're aware of this, but I wanted to um, just remind everyone who's listening in uh, about our Center Court 360 um, concept, which is an incredible concept, which is designed at developing the holistic student athlete. So, um, you know, within that program each week, we put out a series of webinars. Um, yesterday we had Emma Doyle. It was absolutely awesome. Um, that topic was about training the inner voice and finding your inner coaching ability. Um, we, we've, we've got just such great stuff going on there. There's also tutors coming from top, um, institutions in the area to assist any of the uh, students who are struggling or need help right now. Um, we've got a lot of content related to kids looking to get to college. Uh, do they need help with essays, uh, preparation of uh, SAT, ACT, anything like that. So I think it's just really important if you've got time um, and you can put it to learning whilst you are out of the tennis court, this is the time. And as Liam said earlier, uh, being a student of the game is, is what we're all about. Um, we really hope that everyone's using the time well. So with that, that being said, Liam Smith, good luck uh, for the rest of the year. We'll be following closely. We'll expect you to come and visit us um, around the US Open. Uh, yeah, we'd love to. Court. Yeah, we'd love to have you, mate. Come out and um, teach some of our kids how to rip some of those Monfield balls.
<laughs> and thank you. Thank you for having me. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, of course. Thanks as well. Yeah, hope to see you hopefully in September when, uh, when you're in. Let's hope we can, we can play again soon, yeah. Love it. Good luck. Thanks a lot, Liam. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.